morning. Great to, uh, to see you. And uh, it's good to be able to meet together and uh, to catch up. Let me pray as we open, and then we'll sing our first hymn. Father God, we, we thank you for your blessings, for your goodness, for being with us, for keeping us. And Lord, we just pray now that through your spirit, you will meet with us as we worship you together. Amen. We're going to stand, if we're able, and sing our first hymn, Behold Our God. Let's sing together. Um, it's Palm Sunday, and I actually did uh, John's uh, account of Palm Sunday a couple of weeks ago. Um, so we will be looking at the, the next part, um, well, the next few verses from, from John chapter 12. And, and then on Friday, on Good Friday, um, where we'll meet, I'll, I'll think about the cross. Obviously, it's Good Friday. Uh, and really, the next part of John's Gospel, where we are, um, it's all about the Son of Man being being lifted up, and uh, we'll look to to consider and think about that as we think about uh, what happened on that first Good Friday. But this morning, we're going to look at John chapter twelve, and I'm just going to read 
three verses. Yeah, three verses. I always get this wrong. Uh, verses 24 to 26. So John chapter 12, uh, verses 24 to 26. Uh, so let's read together. So Jesus is speaking. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Whoever loves his life loses it, and whoever hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. If anyone serves me, he must follow me, and where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honour him. Amen. Let's turn to God in prayer this morning, shall we? Let's, let's worship him in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the Bible. We thank you for the encouragement that we read there. We thank you for the challenges that we read there. Lord, we thank you that when, when we're going through tough times and hard times, that you bring your word to our minds and it encourages us. And we thank you for the truth of that. We thank you for just being with us these last few days and weeks. Lord, each in very different circumstances, but you are the same God. You've made the same promises to us to never leave us nor forsake us. And we thank you that you are one who keeps his promises. Be with us, we pray, this day and in the coming days. Father, we, we think too of all that's going on in our world and Lord, we do cry out to you that you will show mercy, that you will bring peace. Lord, we think of uh, Ukraine and Russia and all that's happening. We pray for your churches there, that you'll help them to stand firm in the gospel as they seek to help in, in very practical ways, but also to, to share the good news of the Lord Jesus. We pray too for our land. We pray for all that's going on in this country. We pray, Lord, for the various political parties we pray for those who are in leadership roles. And Lord, we just pray for wisdom. We pray, Lord, that you'll encourage them to do the right thing according to your word. We pray for the king and the royal family as they seek to, to lead and to rule. Lord, we, we miss our queen. We thank you that she loved you and her faith in you was so important. And we pray, Lord, that that will be a reality too in the in the current reign. Lord, we pray for our friends and our families. We pray for them, Lord. We, we ask that you will be close to them and help them, Lord, as they, they wind their way through this world. Lord, perhaps, perhaps they're lost. And so, Lord, we pray that just as you sort out the sheep and the coin in the parable, that you will seek them out and find them and draw them to yourself. So be with us, we pray, as we worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. Before we come to the sermon, we're going to sing our next hymn, Yet Not I. Let's sing together.
It's a, as I say, it's a, it's a regular discussion in our household. Um, it happens most weeks, usually Sunday lunchtime, that I get asked the question. And the question tends to be from my wife, what title was the sermon today? What title do you want to give the sermon? And if I'm honest, I don't normally have one. And it's like, oh, Ali, I don't know. And then usually she's really good and she'll think of a, a napped title for when she's doing all the techie bits that takes her, depending on how much I mess up, take, can take her a while to sort it out. But what's the title? Now, today, today I have a title. You'd be, yeah, hooray. You'll be, well, you may not be very pleased to know. The title is this. Why you should hate your life. Oh. oh, great. It's not a very nice title. Why you should hate your life. Oh, come on, Matt. Come on, surely, surely there's enough doom and gloom in the world that you're going to have to preach a sermon that's entitled Why I Should Hate My Life. After all, most people seek to, to love their lives, don't they? They want to they wanna improve it. I'm sure there's not many people actually wandering around and wonder, wand, wandering and wondering. It's very close, isn't it? How can I hit my life? Oh, come on, it just doesn't help build self-esteem. But here's why I think why you should hate your life is a good title for a sermon, at least this sermon, and it's this. Because Jesus said we should do it. And I suppose if there's no other reason, that's good enough. And, and it's not something that you would naturally, I, I put it to you, it's not something that you would naturally do, not without thought or effort. After all, to do it, you have to, to think carefully about what it means and, and, and to work at it daily. It's not a do it once and, and you're done kind of thing. And also, Jesus says that if I hate my life in this world, I will keep it to eternal life. So, so this isn't just some help, self-help advice about, about how to have your best life now. Actually, it's more important than that. Than that. It's about your eternal destiny. But we do need to be clear on what Jesus meant and how we should apply it. Now, we shouldn't um, rush, if that's the right word, skip. We shouldn't skip over any of, of Jesus' teachings. No, because of who he is. But when he repeats a message often, we really need to pay attention. And he actually gives us, gives us a clue here in, tw in verse 24 that we need to pay special attention because he starts the verse with truly, truly. Now that means wake up. Don't miss this, Jesus is saying. Think carefully about what I'm going to say. This is important. That's what Jesus means when he says truly, truly. And then Jesus goes on to, to speak about and talk about himself, that he is the grain of wheat that dies so that it may bear much fruit. And in that, actually Jesus is also our example. We are to, to die to ourselves so that we will bear much fruit. And then in verse 25, he goes on to... Uh, Direct it to us in the form of a paradox, you know, a paradox where, where he says something, or something is said, two things are said, and they seem totally opposite to each other, north and south pole. And yet, it makes sense. That's verse 25. And then he follows that up in verse 26 with a promise as to why we should do what we should do. And Jesus actually saw, taught the same truths 
in the book of Gospels of Matthew and of Mark and of Luke. In fact, in Mark, let me, let me cite, let me quote Mark 8, verses 34 to 38, and you'll see what I mean. It says this, And he summoned the crowd with his disciples and said to them, this is Jesus, If anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake and the gospels will save it. For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? For what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For whoever is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will also be ashamed of him when he comes in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. See, Jesus' words apply to everybody who wants to follow him. He assumes that we all want to save our lives, but he tells us that the way to save our lives is to lose them for his sake and the gospel. And he's talking about saving or losing our lives eternally here. That's the big thing. I mean, the last phrase of the verses I just read shows that in where he says, in the glory of his Father with the holy angels. That's the future. So it's vitally important that to understand and apply Jesus' words in the text. And I suppose if you wanted not a title this time, but an, an overall message, surely it's this. You should hate your life in this world because you want to follow Jesus and serve Jesus and be with him forever. And as we go through these, these few verses, I want you to, or I'll, I'll pick them out for you, and I want us to consider really three, three points, three major points. I might throw a, a few, throw a few sub points in as I go. And they're this, the first one is the servant's model. We're the servant and we have a model to follow. And then the servant's mandate, how, what we should do and how we should do it. And then I'll finish with the, with the motivation, the servant's motivation, which is to be with Jesus and to be honoured by the Father. So that first one, the servant's model. See, by laying down his life on the cross, we read in verse 24, Jesus bore much fruit. That's what he says. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Jesus there is looking forward to the cross. He's looking forward to Good Friday. He, as I said, is the grain of wheat that fell into the ground, died, and bore much fruit. By giving his life as a ransom for many, Jesus, what's the phrase, brought many sons to glory. He bore much fruit. Now, we can, we can never imitate Jesus in his substitutionary death for sins of others. His death was unique. Why? Because, because Jesus is unique. He is the only God-man. He is the eternal word made flesh who came into the world. He is the Lamb of God who came to take away the sins of the world. Only Jesus could do that. But in another sense, his death was an example for us all. During his, his short ministry on earth, Jesus was, was constantly dying to himself as he loved and served others. Later on, we haven't come to it yet, but in John chapter 13, we read that the Jesus took a towel and a basin of water to wash the disciples' feet. That, that was the job of the lowliest servant, not the Son of God. But Jesus did it as an example of how we are to, to lay aside our lives in serving one another. The accumulation of Jesus' dying to himself 
was him literally laying down his life on the cross for us. That's how we bought much fruit, bore much fruit. When we follow him by daily dying to ourselves to serve others, we too will bear much fruit. And so, if you like, prove our, ourselves to be his disciples. And Jesus applies this, this example to us in verse 25. This is the servant's mandate. See, to follow Jesus, you must hate, not love, your life in this world. Verse 25, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world will keep it to life eternal. The word life there is used three times. In the first two um, usages, the, in Greek it's translated life as psyche, which, which translates as soul. The last life is translated slightly different in Greek. It comes from the Greek for zoe, zoe Z-O-E, forgive my pronunciation. And that refers to the eternal life that God gives. See, Jesus assumes that we all want to keep our souls or our lives to eternal life. And here's the paradox. The way to keep your life, Jesus says, is to hate it. The way to lose it is to love it. Also, it's not just aimed, I mean, we've all heard accounts of those missionaries and, you know, who have, who have left everything behind, gone to serve the Lord Jesus and be martyred. And, and rightly so, we honor them. But Jesus is saying, I'm not just talking about the martyrs like that. I'm talking about all my followers. This is for all who follow Jesus. All that follow him are in the daily process of hating their lives in this world. They are the ones who keep their lives eternally. So I suppose the big question is, what does it mean to love your life in this world and to hate your life in this world? Because that seems to be the crux of the matter here. Well, to follow Jesus, you must not love your life in this world. And what does that mean? Well, that means loving your life in this world means living as if this is your only life. Living as if this is it. That's what Jesus means by in this world. It's to live as if this world is all there is. So to, you know, just do everything you can to get your enjoyment right here, right now. Because, and people will say this, because this is your best life, they will say. Jesus told a man who was enjoying his best life now, and he said to his soul in Luke 12, 19, Soul, you have many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said to him in Luke 20, uh, 12, 20, You fool, this very night your soul is required of you, and now who will own what you have prepared? And then Jesus concludes in verse 21, So is the man who stores up treasure for himself, and is not rich towards God. So that man, he loved this life now, and he did everything he could to get as much as he could, and God said, you fool. You fool. This very night, your soul is required of you. Those who live life as if this life is all that there is, their aim is literally that, to, to accumulate as much fame, celebrity maybe, money, power, Stuff as they think that they will make them happy. I suppose their, their motto is, he who dies with the most toys win. But Jesus actually says he loses. Living your life in this world means living for the same things that people live in this world for. What do people without Christ in this world live for? Well, John tells us in 1 John 2, 15 to 17, he says this, Do not love the world, nor the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the, wor the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, 
and the lust of the eyes and the boastful pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. The world is passing away and also it lusts, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. Now, if, if, if greed and, and accumulating this world's stuff is, is a temptation for you, then I urge you to learn those verses and to, to bring them to your mind often. After all, we live in a world where, where adverts just bombard us, don't they, with, with daily messages. You know, to be happy, you need to have the latest kitchen, oven, car, holiday, clothes, whatever it may be. They say, to be happy, you need to buy the stuff that we're selling. Buy this, oh, and you'll be happy. Now, I have to be honest, I like a lot of the stuff that they're selling. I'm not going to lie. I'm not going to lie. And you know what? Some of it makes my life easier, makes my life more comfortable, makes my life easier to navigate. I'm thankful for computers, believe it or not. I'm thankful for the internet. It, it helps me. It helps me in, in my preparation. I can, I can do a lot more research a lot, a lot quicker. And, and there, there are lots of other wonderful features. And the same can be said for many other things in this world. But I have to be on guard against loving those things. If I love those things as opposed to doing the will of God, well, John says the love of the Father is not in me. Loving your life in this world is the sure way to lose it, we're told. That's what the beginning of verse 25 says. He who loves his life loses it. It's the same thing that's said in Mark 8.35. For whoever wishes to save his life will lose it. And it's the same as Mark 38.36. To gain the whole world and forfeit his soul. Let me, let me put it nicely. People are crazy. People are crazy. I read an, an article. And in, in 1981, a man was flown into the, the remote Alaskan wilderness. He was a photographer. And he was there to, to photograph the oh, just the natural beauty of the area. And let's face it, it is beautiful. He had the photo equipment. He had hundreds of rolls of films. It's in the old days before memory cards. He had, he had the relevant firearms, you know, lots of bears. He had to protect himself. Had all that covered. He took with him over half a ton of food and provisions. This was a well-thought-out expedition. And as the months passed, well, the entries in his diary, which, which at first documented the, the wonder and, and the fascination with the wildlife around him, turned more into a record of a nightmare. In August, he wrote, I think I should have used more foresight about arranging my departure. I'll soon find out. And he waited, and he waited, but no one came to his rescue. In November, he died in a nameless valley by a nameless lake, 225 miles northeast of Fairbanks. And, and during the investigation, well, it, it revealed that he had carefully planned for his adventure. And yet he'd made no provision of how to be flown out of the area. Just bypassed him. Okay, that's a, that's a bit short-sighted, isn't it? All that planning and that didn't work out how he was going to get home, how he was going to get out. And yet, how many people live their lives without making any plans for their departure to face eternity? The statistics on death are quite impressive. You know for certain that you will be departing. I will be departing this world at some point. And you know that you won't be taking any of your stuff with you when you go. 
So why don't more people, including actually Christians, think more seriously about Jesus' words that we read here in John 12, 25, he who loves his life loses it. Our, our goals, our, our desires, the way we spend our money on our lives shouldn't be focused on this life only. Loving your life in this world is the sure way to lose it. But, but let's look at the flip side. To follow Jesus, you must hate your life in this world. <laughs> so what does that mean? Are you supposed to become a monk? Are you, you know, are you supposed to take a, a vow of poverty? Do you have to wear hair shirts, you know, the really scratchy, uncomfortable ones? Are you to have no contact with the outside world? Are you to spend hours, I have to be careful what I say now, um, singing Gregorian chants? Is it wrong to enjoy life? What does it mean to hate my life in this world? Well, to hate our lives, as we see it here in John 12, 25, is the same thing as, as denying ourselves and, and taking up our cross daily to follow Jesus. It means that we must daily reject self-centeredness. It means living for God's glory and his purpose by submitting every, every thought, every word, every deed to the Lordship of Jesus. It means moment by moment, seeking to love God and love others for Jesus' sake. By saying no to my natural selfishness and pride. Consider this about hating your life in this world. Hating your life in this world means dying to selfishness in order to love others for Jesus' sake. As I said, hating your life in this world is the same thing as taking up your cross daily. Many Christians think to, to bear their cross means putting up with a, with a difficult mate or with a painful disorder, maybe some sort of ailment. But taking up your cross is not an unavoidable trial that you must endure. Jesus says that it's a, it's a daily activity that you choose to embrace. In Jesus' day, the cross wasn't a, an uh, implement of irritation, inconvenience, actually, or even suffering. The cross was an instrument of torturous, slow execution. Jesus' hearers knew that a man who took up his cross was, for all practical purposes, a dead man walking. A man bearing his cross gave up all hope and interests in the things of this world, including self-fulfillment. He knew that in a, in a very short time, he would be leaving this world. He really was dead to self. Taking up your cross or hating your life in this world is not something you achieve in, a, in an emotional moment of, of spiritual ecstasy or dedication. You never arrive on a, on a spiritual mountaintop where you can sigh with relief and say, I'm finally here, no more death to self. No, nor are there any shortcuts or quick fixes to this painful process. The need to hate my life or die to self is never finished in this life. It is a daily battle. A T. Pearson said this, getting rid of the self-life is like peeling an onion layer upon layer and a tearful process. Yes, Jesus' death on the cross was the supreme act of love in human history. Now, while I said we can't die to pay for other sins to the extent that we follow Jesus' example by dying to our own selfishness for the sake of others' ultimate good, we are imitating his example of love. In other words, self-sacrifice for others, highest good is, is the essential of biblical love. Maybe you're wondering, why should I want to die to myself and live for Christ, live for and others? 
Well, the answer is the third point. It's our mandate, if you like, I'm sorry, our motivation. If we serve Jesus and follow him, we will bear much fruit. We will be with him forever. And the Father will honor us. I had to think carefully about that last phrase. And I, I almost considered not putting it in. But when you read the text, it's there, verse 26. If anyone serves me, he must follow me. And where I am, there my servant will be also. If anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. So these are Jesus' words. It's not something I've made up. To serve Jesus, you must follow him with the goal of bearing much fruit. Jesus assumes that all his people will serve him. And all who serve him must follow him. That means what? Obeying his teachings and his commands. But in the context, it especially means following him by dying to self so that we might, like Jesus, bear much fruit. As he tells his disciples in, in John 15, 6, he chose them so that they would bear fruit. If the Lord has chosen you, then that's your purpose. And, and fruit refers to what? To, to character qualities, to behavior, to service that he produces in and through us as we abide in him. And then comes the motivation. If we serve and follow Jesus, we will be with him forever and the Father will honor us. Jesus here doesn't say that he will be with us, although that is true. Rather, he says that we will be with him. In John 14, 3, I say we haven't got there yet, he promises, if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you will be also. That where I am refers to heaven. To be with Jesus in heaven throughout eternity is more than sufficient reward for all the trials and the persecution that we may go through in this life. And on top of all that, Jesus promises that the Father will honor us. Oh, and I've thought about what that means, and I can't even imagine what that will look like. The Father honoring us. I don't know what that entails. But surely all the honors that this world can give will pale into significance by comparison to the honor that the Father will give those who have faithfully served his son. So if you want to preserve your life, Jesus says, you'll die alone. But if you die to self for Jesus' sake, you will bear much fruit. So why should you hate your life in this world? Because you want to follow Jesus and you want to be like him. You want to serve him and be with him forever. There are some really famous words by a very famous missionary, martyr, a guy called Jim Elliott, and he says this, and I'll finish with this. He says, He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let me say that again. He is no fool who gives what he cannot keep to gain that which he cannot lose. Let's sing, shall we, our last hymn this morning, When This Passing World Is Done.